It's no secret that the California housing bubble has popped with hardships spread wide. Real estate expert Robert Kiyosaki predicted all of this would happen back in 2005, but most people didn't listen. It's the biggest financial bubble in the history of the world, so I have the, I have the benefit of traveling the entire world. All markets go up, all markets come down, so the market will come back. But right now, it's going to be a sled ride down. It might be a down for a long time, simply because it's going to take more of a down payment because nobody trusts anybody anymore. And the next big sacred cow is your home is an asset. See, in 1997, I wrote in Rich Dad Poor Dad, your house is not an asset. And at that point, every realtor stopped sending me Christmas cards. <laughs> <laughs> because your home is not your asset. Your home is actually your bank's asset if you could read a financial statement. So, Kenny, you own lots of real estate? Yes. Is your home an asset? No, not my personal residence. A lot of people are in trouble today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't produce any revenue. It's, it's, right. You know, I, I pay the bank every month. It, it's the bank's asset. Yeah, and what everybody's to tell me, I want, my house has appreciated in value. Again, that's capital gains versus cash flow. And what the people are finding out now that the real estate market has crashed, and this is all over the world, the value of their home has been sucked out. And so now that somehow people are upside down because they're really finding out it's a liability because they still have to pay the bank on that mortgage. You know, so let's say they bought a house for 200000 they still owe 180000 but the house is only worth 100000 now. And they're now finding out that your house is not an asset, it's a liability. And I'll tell you, I'm the largest originator of FHA and VA loans in the entire country out of everybody. I rent. What does that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> but as an account, is a house an asset? Oh, no, you know, the bank considers it. You know, they'll say it's an asset, and the financial planners will say it, it's an asset. But the reality is, it, it's not an asset unless it's putting money in your pocket. And a house just drains money from your pocket. And, and the thing that I, one of the, my little pet peeves is that people say, well, if you own a house, though, you get a deduction yeah. for the interest. Yeah. Yes, but it's money out of your pocket. And the best you can get is 40 cents on the dollar. Okay, so you're given a dollar and you get 40 cents back. You're still out 60 cents. It's not difficult math. Your home is shelter. It's a place to raise a family. But it's not an asset that you're ever going to make money it's, it's on. It's not a financial asset. No, you might make money in an uptrending market, but today the market's trending down. And that's why in 1997, what I said in Rich Dad Poor Dad, your house is not an asset, was heresy. Now people are going, oh my God, I should have listened to him. So I'm not saying don't buy a house. I'm saying just don't be financially ignorant and call your house an asset if it's taking money out of your pocket. Because Kim and I own two houses, one here in Arizona and one beautiful beach house in Hawaii, and they're our biggest liabilities. People did think, especially in the high times, you know, in the, in the, when the markets were high, they did think their house was an asset. And people, even if they had their mortgage paid off, they were borrowing against their house and putting it into the stock market or wherever they were putting it. So not only were they getting crazy mortgages, but they were taking money out against their house in second, third mortgages. Well, and, and they were doing it for things like vacations ah, and yes. boats, <laughs> boats and cars and other things like this. And, and the reality is the reason they were doing that is because they got to deduct the interest off their taxes. Oh. And so they thought that, well, this is okay because I get a deduction. But uh, just yeah. because you get a deduction doesn't make it a good thing to do. Well, yeah, one of the trouble. big mistakes people make is over-improving their house. <laughs> you know, they put in a $50,000 swimming pool and it brings them $20,000 worth of value. Well, the way I look at it is you just bought a $30,000 babysitter. 50% of the mortgages in Reno are underwater, meaning that the mortgage is greater than the value of the property. All right, and this affects the whole community because people aren't able to sell their homes and move to a place where they can get a better job. The neighbors aren't going to sell their house because values are so far down. So this has affected entire communities. And again, we've, we've heard people say that your home is an asset. Well, we're talking here about financial education, and this is one of the biggest financial lessons that our country has had to learn a very hard way, that your home is not an asset. This has happened before, and what's going to happen is new laws will come in, new credit will be loosened again here years from now, and the prices will come up again, and people will do it again. It's about a 20-year cycle as in anything. The point here is this. This is the best time to be buying real estate. If you are a first-time home buyer, this is your best time. Just don't call it an asset. You know, this is the best time to getting back in the market. and. That's why it takes financial education. The reason I'm in real estate is for one reason, it's debt. 
is one of the easiest assets to get debt on is real estate. But if you're going to use debt, you've got to be highly financial and intelligent. Otherwise, if you're not intelligent, just keep calling your house an asset. We're talking a lot about assets, and there are four primary asset classes. One is business. As an entrepreneur, you own a business. Number two is real estate. And we love rental properties that cash flow, real estate that puts money in our pocket every single month. Number three are paper assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, savings. Most E's and S's are in paper assets today. And number four are commodities, gold, silver, precious metals, oil and gas. For Robert and I, we're in business. We're in real estate. We own hundreds of properties in real estate. We have paper assets and we have commodities. So for us, when we talk about diversification, we're in all four asset classes. Now we're going to shoot one of the more evil of all the sacred cows. Evil for most people. Get out of debt. I mean, a lot of people are saying, cut up your credit cards. I think that's really ridiculous because a credit card is not the problem. In fact, I love my credit cards. I don't know how anybody could get along today without a credit card. But the credit card isn't the problem. It's lack of financial education is the problem. The entire currency supply, all of the dollars in existence, require debt. You can't have a dollar without debt. A dollar is just an IOU. It's borrowed into existence, either by the government creating a bond, which promises to pay interest. Uh, you know, you've got to pay out of future taxes. Uh, or people uh, create currency by taking out a loan at the bank, fractional reserve lending. Every month, there's a payment due on those dollars that you created. Right, and this credit card is a fast way of creating money, because there's really no money in this card. See, let's say I go to the store, there's no money in it, and I, I charge $100. Like magic, $100 is created and it flows into the economy. That's why debt is good. But when you abuse this, that's when we get in trouble. So I think, you know, Mr. Rodney here, you see the horror stories of bad debt, don't you? Yeah, I've seen people walk into my office that make $150,000 a year, but they have $250,000 in credit card debt. You know, let's face it, we live in a credit society and you do have to have credit. And we have to learn how to survive and thrive in, this, in our credit economy that we are. But, you know, people are walking in and they have this bad debt and they're asking, what do we do with it? Well, number one, you try to pay off the bad debt so you can invest in good debt, which would be real estate. And we love debt, don't we? Yeah, we have a lot of debt. <laughs> Our real estate that, that we own is all basically financed with, with our tenants. So that's what I consider to be good debt. So when, when we get real estate, uh, you know, we, we get uh, proper leverage and it's paid by all the residents who live in all of our projects. Well, and, and it's not just real estate. Business is the same way. I and mean, we have good debt in business as well. So that the business is paying. We have debt in our business. But that's how we grow. And it's the cash flow from the business that's able to pay the debt. And the debt creates more cash flow. Time out. Capital gains versus cash flow. See, in my opinion, 90% of the people invest for capital gains. That's why they say, well, my stock price went up or my house went up in value. That's capital gains. People like myself understand cash flow. In other words, I want a steady paycheck every single month. For example, my apartment house, every month it puts cash flow in my pocket. So if you want to be rich, you have to know there's between capital gains and cash flow. Capital gains is technically gambling. You're hoping something will change. Cash flow is more guaranteed. I want that income every month. So very intelligent investors invest for both capital gains and cash flow. People say, I like real estate. I don't really like real estate. I just love debt. Because it's so easy to get a loan on real estate, right? Well, here, I like the analogy that you use sometimes. Say, if you put a million dollars of, of cash into a mutual fund, you get whatever you get paid. But if you put a million dollars of it in, uh, in a down payment, uh, you know, for, uh, for some kind of a commercial project like we have, you actually buy a $5 million project. Right. So, so you're actually getting a $5 million asset with a million dollars versus a million dollars of mutual funds. And so you're, you know, the, the value you're creating on that real estate is, is, is on the five million, not the one million, well, you, by the, using and, bank's leverage. And the tax benefits that you get on the real estate isn't on the one million either. It's on the five million. So, so you, you not only increased leverage on your cash flow and on, on your growth in your asset, but you've also increased your leverage on your tax 